<laughs> Hi, my name is Jonathan Allen. I'm based in uh, Brooklyn, New York, and um, delighted to be on this panel today with uh, my colleagues. Um, as a short introduction, um, I've been in New York two decades and um, and mainly a painter, but um, also work in public art and performance um, and video and at times um, animation and collage. So I consider myself an interdisciplinary artist. Um, I'm not going to go through all that today. I'm going to keep it pretty brief and focus on one project um, that I've been uh, working on. It's a public art project that started in 2017. I'm going to do a quick share screen and just show a few slides. See how this goes. Okay. Can you, or is, am I sharing? Oh yeah. Uh, maybe. I, we I don't see your share screen. Uh, why don't you try it again? It's the button with the little icon there that says share screen, uh -huh. lower left. Oh my, I'm telling it to share. Are you using Chrome? Yes. It's saying okay. share entire screen or window or Chrome tab. Uh, go for the window. All right, it's not letting me share my screen. So I'll just describe this. Um, I've been doing um, uh, a series of public art interventions in the New York City subway system. Um, and it started in 2017 on the heels of, uh, you know, the rightward lurch in this country. Um, and they're really about intervening in advertising. Um, so it's physically installing ad, physically installing interventions and ads in the public um, space of the subway system and about um two two or three years after that project started i new york started putting in tons of lcd screens live video screens all over the city so i did a lot of research and figured out a way to um, intervene in those um, and have been installing text-based works um, on top of these screens in very public spaces and the most recent one was at times square um, it was a very simple message. It was just defend Roe. So often, you know, these public art interventions are speaking to current events and speaking to politics and social realities. Um, and that project has really shifted my um, or amplified my interest in working in the public sphere and kind of the role of the artist, the connection with imagination. How can you reimagine these political and social issues in a public space? Um, and as an addendum to that, I also have a painting practice where I make much less pop, um, much less accessible um, uh, abstract works. And this summer I'm going to be, often these are mixed media and collage based, but this summer I'll be in Sweden um, in a residency at Milvis Artistic Research Center, which is about an hour outside Malmö. Um, and I'm going to be developing a series of paintings that use... Um, the IPCC report um, to, to talk about climate change um, and also try and merge this political information into a series of abstract works and abstract paintings. Um, so that's the next project, but it kind of takes my interest in social and political information, um, but it's going to be a, a new direction. So if there's anybody that's going to be in Sweden this summer, I welcome a studio visit. Well, thank you so much for the wonderful uh, brief discussion uh, presentation. And I would say let's, let's head over to the next one. Thanks again. Me? You're on, Adam. Okay. Yeah, great. let's go for I, it. I believe also, I, I believe that um, Emma, I think they're trying to join as well. Um, yeah. So, yeah, if you... Because I, I do see there. Anyway, uh, my name is Adam Cooley. Um, okay, my name is Adam Cooley. Uh, I'm an artist who is now based in uh, Durham, North Carolina. Um, most of my life has been spent outside the United States. Uh, I deal mostly in painting and sculpture. Um, yeah, I've been living in Japan 
and exhibiting not exclusively there, but for the most part in, in Japan, Asia, um, and England, uh, and, and now here in the United States. That, that's me. Um, I, the next project I'm working on, I'm actually doing something in the city of Buffalo, um, which does, has nothing to do with the recent uh, shooting there. Um, but that's an, an international, I do a lot of international um, art pieces or art pieces involving um, international relations. My last uh, exhibition in Kyoto was with a Japanese Buddhist monk um, where it was combining calligraphy with um, painting. Um, and that finished in February. Um, and this next one coming up in Buffalo is between the city of Buffalo and uh, the city of Kanazawa in Japan. And they have a, a sister, a sister city. It's like their big anniversary. So they're going to do an unveiling of a big painting of mine at the History Museum, um, followed up by an exhibition there as well. So, and then in Kanazawa, but yeah. And I'm, I think when I was looking at this, this topic of igniting human imagination, I tend to focus a lot on um, creating shows that are very publicly accessible. Um, and I think like with your subway, subway um, pieces, I think that kind of, it's along the same line. So I, I do a lot of barrier free artwork exhibitions. Um, that was like the, the first thing I, I did in Japan like 30 years ago when it was, when the term just had just come, come into being there. Yeah. Um, and uh, I really am, I like the idea of getting people involved in art. And I think, especially at a young age, I think that's the other thing that I think I've noticed in America, it's like they're trying to take art out of schools and, and without exposing people to art at a young age, I think you end up losing, uh, the appreciation of it. Um, and I think that kind of creates a distance between the observers and the, the art itself, which I think is a horrible thing that's happening. So, okay, I'm done. All right. Uh, well, thank you very much. And I think Emma, you know what? Uh, there's a reason why you're here. So let's see what's going on. So welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, sorry, that took a bit of a, a jumble to get in. It feels quite um, apt that it's difficult in a way, given what we're talking about and the uh, <laughs> imagination versus like society and expectations. So I think that's quite fun. I'm going to try and share. Is it not possible to share the screens? It should be share lower left hand side, if, you, if at all possible. If yeah, not, we're just winging it. Yeah, fine. It'd just be good to show images, but... Um... Okay, maybe it isn't possible. Yeah, I think the last time it it never worked. That was a, <laughs> just a, a few the last. Hey, time. don't don't you worry. We're we're okay. we're enough. We don't need slides for sure. What a shame. Yeah, there's visual. We're okay. all people. So I'm I'm a painter basically, based in London. I also teach a little bit, um, which I really love. Um, I also do some, I mean, I'm not keen on the word curating as an artist, but do those kind of collaborative projects. Um, and that's international as well as local in London. Um, I used to run a project from my house called Bread and Jam, which was a kind of reaction to the um, gentrification and the financial issues of artists, specifically in London, central London. And also my frustration being stuck in a day job when I wanted to paint full time. And that ran for two years and that's led to lots of other developments and projects along those lines. And uh, lockdown for me, like COVID, I don't want to mention it too much, but I do feel like it was a catalyst for me again to address frustrations. And I started a podcast in that time talking to artists internationally about their practice, about what might have changed for them, the difficulties of COVID and, and making an artistic practice and also what they might have discovered. So I'm kind of constantly juggling these ideas of breakthrough and breakdown, not just in my own work, um, but also in kind of a community or a wider sense um, in my kind of, I don't know, desire to change things, which is, I guess, what we're also trying to talk about here. Um, and, and that's very much fundamental to some of the subjects within the painting, which I'll really briefly describe since you can't see it. 
the paintings are generally life size. They're figurative as in their bodies. And the networks are structures of bodies trying to articulate either words, which often um, involve humor, like puns, metaphor, failure of words. So why, why that gets lost. Thinking about communication, accessibility, uh, agency, aging, um, and also like social mobility and those kind of things. More recently, I've been thinking about, um, I guess, post-human bodies and the future of the human body and what that might be and what that might look like. Um, and trying to examine that um, through the paintings, thinking about machinic or sci-fi or um, mechanized kind of systems as well. So that's bringing that in together as well. And then the other thing in lockdown, um, I actually developed an online uh, across three platforms, an exhibition with a, a co-curator, um, specifically looking at animation. So I think I'm interested in the limitations that these things put on us and how we then respond appropriately thinking about like if we're all stuck in our houses, animation becomes a really exciting medium to view online versus painting, which kind of fails. So I, we could go on and on, but hopefully that's a little overview. Well, thank you very much, Emma, for the wonderful uh, brief overview. Let's see if I can make this uh, share screen work because I'm not really <laughs> sure what's going on. So <laughs> let's get a shot. Show us all up. Uh, all right, let's see what's going on. So... Now I see what's going on. Oh, I get it. Uh, so, um, all right, I'll introduce myself while I'm doing the problem solving here. Um, so my name is Gustavo Rincon, and um, uh, I'm with the Allosphere Research Group at UCSB. I'm a recent graduate from the University of California, Santa Barbara, with a doctorate in media arts and technology. Uh, currently, I'm a postdoctoral fellow and researcher for the Allosphere Research Group. Um, and I, one of the main organizers for Digital Futures World, which is a free educational initiative for architects, uh, artists, and scholars. Um, you can find our YouTubes on Digital Futures World on YouTube.com. Um, we're organizing a huge event this summer called Digital Futures um, at late June. And we're estimated that it should hit between five to you know, five plus thousand for the event, and it'll probably get over 10 to 15,000 after the event. So they don't have to be running concurrent. Uh, one mm -hmm. of the things I wanted to show on the slide is what I do. So basically I help the Allosphere uh, Research Group with installations with my professor, Dr. Joanne Kachamarin. Also, I do my own work, which is a lot of decoloniality and looking at kind of future speculative futures and how that works. And currently I'm um, helping to organize other, uh, let's say organizations like Guild of Future Architects, um, which are really great people from entertainment and high tech and industry. And I think for today, what we really needed to go through, which we will shortly is, um, you know, the arts and igniting imagination. So before I end my presentation briefly, I just wanted to say, do you guys have any other questions about what our topic is today and what you think we're missing um, in our dialogue? So let me start with, um, I think, let me start with Jonathan, since you started. What, what are we missing in this imagination project for, for artists? What are we missing for artists? Yeah, like, do we need money? Do we need help? Do we need more art? Like, I mean, I think uh, to echo something Adam mentioned, I think keeping arts <clears throat> um, in education is super important. Um, and having um, some kind of rigorous uh, arts education that can highlight how art um, can help us think through some of these complicated problems. Um, and issues facing us today. So I think um, I have a nephew in the New York City public school system um, who luckily is at an arts-centered um, middle school, but um, a lot of the his friends are in schools where, where arts uh, education is being cut and, um, you know, limited. And I think uh, getting, establishing some sort of a, an emotional and, conceptual center um, 
for art in your brain and your heart from an early age is super important because it does like uh, it opens you and it can, I think a key part of imagination is being open um, to new ideas. So that, that's something I would stress. And I think um, um, to echo what my other colleague mentioned, I think the more, um, especially, you know, in any of these art, you know, being an artist is a tough game. And I think the structural kind of, um, uh, making money and like being able to leave a day job and being able to focus more um, intensely on your practice um, uh, unleashes your imagination and can um, can help kind of structure uh, you know your time in a more meaningful way in terms of um, pursuing like your imagination and your creative ideas. So those I think would be the two things I would mention. Uh, Adam or Emma. What do you guys think? Ladies first. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll take it. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I guess it's interesting thinking about education because I don't know, I can only speak from like my perspective in London, but it's shifting quite a lot now in terms of, I do feel like education here is being um, made into a commercial enterprise in a way that's problematic because not only is it very expensive, but it becomes like a career trajectory which is very different from, I want to be an artist no matter what. I am an artist because I'm four and I'm drawing stuff, you know. So I think there's like, for, to me, there's quite a disconnect. And you see that with students who just want to know how to get a gallery or um, with a frustration with like how difficult the whole money thing is, which is, you know, I don't know, curious. And, and as a, a kind of response or a solution to that, a lot of Alternative art schools are being set up here. Um, some are very successful, some are more kind of grassroots. But there's something interesting there about ideas around community and around kind of um, agency within the self. Like, what can we change? How can we set something up? How can we activate from the inside? And I think that's quite an exciting, obviously very difficult. I'm not saying these things are like easy. Um, but also, I guess, one of the books I wanted to put on our list was Bell Hooks, All About Love which sounds so corny, like we need more love. But there's a really amazing chapter we, in there about- Emma, we do need more love. I think that that's part of the human <laughs> condition, right? Well, I think because it's interesting that there's a chapter in there all about fear. And I'm interested that we are living in a moment where we're so scared of insecurity. We're scared of not having money. We're fearful of not being successful. And that's all barriers to experiencing the joy or the imagination or the freedom or the- So it, I feel like the mindset- I'm rereading the book and it's it's having a profound effect because I'm like, this is exactly how I'm feeling and how how have I got into this mess? And I'm someone who manages to to make it, you know, to do it every day. So, so I'm interested in in like those kind of values as well. Um, I was gonna say something else, but I can't remember what it was. Um, oh yeah, the only other thing was just this idea of um, in Ireland, there's a, there's a scheme coming up being proposed to pay artists so to pay artists about 325 euros a week um there's only like four i can't remember i wrote the i think 140 arts professionals being offered this thing in ireland for two years i, I believe so i i'm not eligible i'm not going to get that but it's interesting that that's been proposed as like an alternative like do we need to pay artists a salary and then will that make them more successful or, you know or more productive or less yeah. and it's interesting the discussion around that about how do we measure the use of that is that productivity and is that then further further problematic um yeah well so, emma, emma, emma <clears throat> i just wanted to interrupt uh yeah. you know under a capitalist regime and i think it's very difficult for me to understand beyond patronage like in the you know and when we got to this point um i have a lot of friends that graduated with big degrees and they are just uh burdened with debt their the the teaching has dried up the economics have changed so i think um i would just ask adam maybe to respond to the economics and quality of life because it's great to make a painting or a piece of work but if you can't pay the rent or you're hungry or you're having you know health issues i mean is it worth it uh yeah. I would argue no, but uh, adam uh, yes. you go for it yeah for me i i i am totally non-economically focused and it was just terrible probably for for other people around me um but i i just 
I create art and that's what I do. I've always done that. Um, and I try not to focus on, I mean, I try to survive and sometimes I have big windfalls and galleries and museums want to take my pieces. And other times I am just using cold water. I mean, it's like, but I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing for, at least for me, I know as an artist, the struggle is sometimes it's like squeezing the last bits of juice out of a, a fresh lime or, I mean, you get that extra flavor that that's the part that, I mean, I think I create the, the best pieces when I'm under stress and trauma and, and all those kinds of things. So I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing for an artist. It okay. depends. I mean, some people might want to have a very cushy existence, but I, I would say choose a different impression. I mean, well, I so l- let me, let me say something really briefly. I started watching the Andy Warhol biography on Netflix and even having Netflix is a privilege, right? Having a computer is a privilege. It's updated. Television. But I think what I would say is that, you know, artists have this burden of just making it. We have to bootstrap it. And when you see the sciences, because I'm coming at this from art and science, they get billions of dollars to to run experiments and uh, most of them fail. So why aren't we compensated for our artistic experiments, uh, our way of life and and our contributions to knowledge to this world? Um, I would go back to, you know, I would go back to Jonathan. What do you think about why, why aren't we, why don't we have an equivalent, you know, economics for the arts? Uh, is it because everyone uses us and they take our imagery and we're just the toughest people on the planet? What do you think? Um, I think it's, uh, I mean, this is great because I'm, I'm connecting with so many different parts of what people are saying. But why isn't it valued in the same way? I mean, I think, um, but I think it's the amb- I think there's an ambiguity to it. I think w- within a capitalist society, there's it's va- there's certain kinds of art that are valued by the commercial gallery system um, and not others. Um, I just went to the the Warhol Museum in Pittsburgh a couple of weeks ago. Um, and we don't have to spend time on Warhol, but I do think he was, he successfully kind of figured out a model for uh, making art in a, in a corporate um, world. And, um, you know, using pop culture and using the insipidity of it um, and reimagining it. Um, But in terms of the structure, I mean, it's like, it's devastating in terms of the, 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 the structure right now in terms of how people friends of mine and other colleagues uh managing the volatility of a career in the arts um and you know as adam said there are windfalls and then then there are very long droughts um but to return to your actual question i don't know i think it's because there's not a direct people don't view it in the it doesn't have the use value of the sciences it's not as um flashy is a new app um i'm always baffled at, at the, the the level of media attention and um uh really i think it's a prioritiz- prioritization of other fields and careers in the public um dialogue and um i think at least in terms of the visual arts i mean this is a little bit of a generalization but um i think 50 or 100 years ago the general public could probably name more visual artists that were active than they can today. And I think, I mean, that's a lot of different reasons, but I think um, the visual arts, you know, just doesn't get the same level of attention. And I possibly is not as um, uh, not as accessible, you know, um, perhaps the, the, than, than other art forms. Um, it's kind of a meandering response. But... No, no, don't don't worry. We have we we have some time. I think I <laughs> I, I, I want to get into, uh, you know, I'm at a point in my career where uh, you know I don't have to front or represent. I I've met the the billionaires, the industrialists. Like I see the economics, and it doesn't make sense for so many people that are suffering and. If this is about imagination and creativity, artists are some of the most powerful individuals on the planet. We can dream beautiful things. We can partner up with anyone and make movies and and create narratives. And 
narratives, what I understand, uh, help drive the world. So I would go back to Emma. What do you think about narratives driving the world and, and how do we cultivate and nurture um, an imagination project? Maybe a new era of how artists can pair up with others to save the world. Because literally, I think the world is dying, if I don't rem- you know, recall. <laughs> uh, but take it away, Emma. I mean, I just, I kind of worry when these things are, I was, you know, with these questions of like, to save the work, how do we save the world? It's such a huge responsibility then to add to everything else. That's like, I just try to turn up every day, you know, and do the thing. Like, um, So I think there's something, there's a problem or a tension there with like, often these things happen by accident. Like I was trying to think of any art movement that actually act, like actively was trying to change the world. And I think that hasn't, I genuinely couldn't think of anyone, even if you think of like Agnes Martin, like turning inwards, a solipsistic practice against commercialism and capitalism and rejecting studio visits and stuff. It became like super expensive, like abstract art, it took it, took over, it failed, right? But it also succeeded in the, the other way. So I don't know. And then at the same time, um, I guess thinking about this idea of um, if, if that expectation takes away our freedom, and the freedom to to do nothing or to completely... You know, I was thinking about that example. There's a, a Samuel Beckett story. Um, I mean, I'm using narratives to explain stuff, right? Which is maybe answering the question. But anyway, um, <laughs> the, um, Samuel Beckett story at the end. And at one point, so it's this guy who kind of knows he's dying or is at the end of his life. And he goes into this basement. And he's really like living really dingy, kind of like an artist existence in a flat, in a squat flat, can't afford it, etc. And he has one pair of clothes. And every day he has this plant and he has to lift the plant on a pulley up to the window to receive enough light to stay alive. And he religiously like keeps this plant. And to me, I was like, that is the most beautiful performance piece I've ever heard of. Like, (laughs) you know, this idea of like the act of of making or or continuing or, or resisting or insisting in spite of is I wonder what I wonder and I worry what would happen if that was removed or if that was made even more difficult by putting these kind of demands onto the artist. And I, I am interested, I guess, to know, do we think that the fact we're not conscious of the changes our work might make or hope, we hope that it might, I mean, that's, I'm not being completely honest. Obviously we all hope that it might make a difference, but the idea that if we fully knew the impact of these things, we would probably not be making it. And yeah. what that does, I don't know. I mean, that doesn't necessarily, the narrative question and the storytelling I think it's almost to do with changing the story of something small also. Like that's the other thing I was thinking about sure. that sometimes you could see, I mean, we can probably all give references where we've seen one piece of work that could be a painting or a, a, that book, the, the Beckett story. And it changes the way that I look at a basement flat or a certain angle of light or a bit of soil or whatever it is. And I wonder if that's more what it is. It's these small perspective shifts rather than these grandiose changing the world and I'm aware that's also problematic at a time when someone needs to to save it right so yeah yeah Can I jump uh, in here there's, there's a great quote I, I don't know who said this but the um because I, I I know what you're saying Emma in terms of like the expectation for artists to to change the world or to to uh necessarily make overt work which I don't I mean I make both kinds of work so I've, I have a pretty elastic um approach to meaning and um but somebody there's some quote that says art doesn't change the world but it changes the minds of the people who are going to change the world and i think i mean i thought of a quote as you were talking because i think it's these small shifts and i think there there's there there are non-linear things that happen when you see a painting or a sculpture or performance um that that shift how you view some other um larger issue or um and i think you know to return to the theme i think that's the most powerful aspect of art is that it helps it helps um helps us reimagine these these complex realities can i um sorry can i ask Jonathan how you define you said two strands of your work and you do both can i ask how you define those two oh yes that's right Yeah, you weren't here for the introduction. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I was, but I was only caught. I was wondering if you do, how you defined it, and because I, I um, would, I know how I would say what you do, but it'd be interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the two between the two, the I work 
there, there's a lot going on in the studio, but I think the two focuses right now are a public art project that's really trying to be super pop, super accessible, super graphic, was designed for social media. It's kind of ridiculous. Um, so that's one channel. But then I'm also working on these medium to large scale mixed media paintings uh, that are much more poetic and much more ambiguous, um, look terrible on Instagram um, and uh, are more, I hesitate to use difficult, but like you need time with them to, to get into the layers and they have to be seen in person. Um, and yeah, th those are sort of the two poles. So uh, before we move on, Adam, I know you've been a little quiet. I, I don't know. I, 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 no, I, I don't think the table, no, no. You know? no, no. Yeah, I, think? I, think, I think as an artist, I think it's good to divorce yourself from the economic aspect of art. Do you know what I mean? I, I think that's that should never be your focus. I think people that get into art to make money aren't probably real artists. Do you know what I mean? And I think, but I think everyone's an artist. And it was like something that I, I recently took part in the uh, a Cameron Museum. They had they have a they open the museum up to the public, and they allow everyone to bring one piece of art to be displayed in the museum. And I thought that was phenomenal. There was all kinds of art. There was great pieces, terrible pieces, um, but I I I think making Allowing people to realize that everyone is an artist, really. I mean, everyone's an artist. Everyone's an artist. It's just what they're producing or um, what what they want to express. And I think the problem with the, uh, the society, especially in the United States, is it's very money focused. It's trying to make you have to be successful. It means you have to be economically successful. But I think the like, great art inspires people. And it, I mean, it inspires change. I mean, think of how many songs like you, you get your heart broken and there's this one song that you hear and it <laughs> sticks and you hear it. And every time you hear it, it's still like that same feeling rises up in you. And I think like, I mean, as a, as a child, I, I saw, I think it was called the Magnificent Sauce. It was a, a classical painting in the Albright Knox. And I, I thought, I I saw that painting and for some reason the red in it will stick in my mind forever. This, this just one shade of red. Um, and I think that's the way that we end up changing the world is, is through our little, our little steps, not a, a giant uh, proclamation kind of thing. Hi. So, so Adam, I just wanted to, and everyone, I wanted to welcome uh, Carola here. And yes, I yes. think if, if you don't mind briefly, uh, you know, saying why you're here and we're basically going through the idea of art where we are the state of the world and the imagination project of art and how we can make things uh make the world a better place but carola yes please, the floor is yours yes can everyone hear me yes okay okay well actually um yeah art is created eh, consciously through an expression imagination or a normal idea by the artist and i think uh, as an artist creativity is how we uh, share our calling to the world and we want to awake people to see their own lives from a different perspective <coughs> and therefore initiate transformation so uh, art gives, in my opinion, a different idea about yourself and it makes you think in different ways. And one of the things as an artist which drives me is to show people their own beauty and potential. I don't know if it's possible to show a picture of one of my... Uh, you know, we can try. Everyone's Creation. <laughs> everyone can, everyone's try, like that, so you go for it. As I joined uh, last minute... <laughs> Uh, a, a, a lower left hand side it says share screen but while you're doing that I think um, anyone want to uh, step in a little bit while um, you know Carola is trying to share screen anyone want to oh, jump to in about art and imagination are you able to share my picture or no? no no I think you have to share it on the lower left hand side it says share screen oh 
Okay. Well. Don't you don't you worry. We can keep it's going. Riddle. Yeah. Share <laughs> screen. Oh, then I need to download Chrome again. Well. All right. All right. <laughs> Well, I think, I'm, not, I think, I'm not going there. Yeah, we're, so we're, we're uh, improvising today. So yeah, let's, well, let's, let's yeah, improvise. it's really improvising. Yeah. Um, no, actually, what I created in terms of um, making people more um, uh, aware and self-conscious, um, I created 17 artworks of uh, women, mirror artworks, and, for example, Michelle Obama uh, for her faith, Oprah, because I want to reflect myself in her, um, mm -hmm. in her wisdom, Beyonce for her femininity, and all these women, eh, role models with different cultural identities, they all share mutual sense of companionship and self-belief and principles, basic principles of living. And I want to invite people to find their own inner voice. Eh, growing is all about... Uh, stepping out of your comfort zone, uh, unlocking those masks and facing your fears and believing in yourself. And with these artworks, um, you're able to, to see yourself with a different, uh, you can see yourself through the eyes of someone you admire. So it's all about uh, self-awareness, uh, reflection and transformation. Wonderful. Well, we're we're winding down. We have seven minutes, so um, yeah. just to preface this, we want to actually get final thoughts. Uh, but uh, let's actually start with you, Jonathan. Like, what what do you think about imagination in the arts? And then, what do you want to what do want to leave leave to all of our participants here? Today? Oh my gosh, um, <laughs> pressure. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think to to echo something Carol just mentioned, I think um, the self the the journey of reflection and the journey of we've been talking a lot about um ex, a lot of external things and things kind of outside of art that art touches on and can affect and my work definitely has a more pub one part of my work has a more public um uh exterior facing kind of sensibility to it but i think uh the it, it's nice to get some in, more interior um um thoughts about the role of art and how art can help reimagine um you know how you how you deal with the world and how you deal with your feelings and how you deal um with, with this human condition that we're all struggling with and that we're yeah battling through every day um and i think uh like i did a, about a year ago i started a series of paintings um that i didn't really touch on in this panel but um i have a mentally ill family member and it's been such a journey um trying to help them. I bring that up to say that, that making um, a body of paintings and making a group of about 20 works that are super physical and super um, emotive was a way for me to reimagine um, the idea of care and the idea of love. So I would, I would say that I think that um, the more personal kind of dimension uh, of of art and imagination um, is also super valuable, um, and uh, uh, you know, seeing how artists reimagine their journeys and their um, experiences in the world is is so valuable, and I think um, um, super important. Thank you very much, Adam. Emma, I know that you're ready to go. So why don't you <laughs> give us one like one minute? Like, what do you think oh. we need to hear? What do you think, um, like a small child or a small boy or someone who's lost that hear your words? What 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 do they want to hear? Oh, I, I, that is a big question, and I'm not sure I'm qualified. I mean, <laughs> I mean, a small boy, I'd be like, continue, continue, continue looking at that snail and thinking it's the best thing you've ever seen. Cool, like, that's amazing. awesome. But I um I was I was wondering about I mean this is, I can't ask another question, but this idea of activism is kind of feels like what we're talking about as well, and I was wondering about art. And imagination and activism and these kind of connections but that's a whole different question so I suppose the things I want to leave us with maybe or leave myself I was trying to think about this would be one would be pace shifts specifically after COVID everything mm -hmm. slowed down I found it so much easier to access memory history kind of um you know the difficulty the struggle was much more kind of I could sit with it it was 
something that was helpful, if anything. So this idea of the pace, how do we change that is something I'm asking myself. I think we should all be asking, like, what can we really learn from that period? And, and how do we keep hold of some of the good stuff? Um, the connections. So something I'm, again, asking myself, no, I don't run the house as a project. I'm like, what else can I do? Is that like sharing food? Is that um, setting up uh, like a library talk evening where we share texts? Is it um, going for walks and having kind of collaborative engagement that way? Um, so anything that we can do individually to, to change something. And I think that can often come out of struggle again. So a bit like what Jonathan was saying, it could be very personal. Like, you know, I can't speak to my grand, so I'm going to start drawing to her and she'll draw back and we'll have this dialogue. And then we'll make it into a coloring book and then give that to old people in care homes that can't leave. Like that was a project I did in lockdown. So, um, and then the other thing is, it sounds again, um, this is the last thing, sorry. It, it's um, All right, it's, minute, well, uh, a few seconds. Self, pro self projects. So that yeah. I, by that I mean like the morning pages, like writing first thing in the morning or oh, yeah. dance and movement, like things like um, what can I do with a chair that's about learning about the chairness of a chair or um, those kind of projects. Dance is really key, um, not just in knowing about ourselves, but in how we are in the world and how we use space, take up space, interact with other people. And then within that also is this idea of dreaming. So cognitive, like yoga nidra is the new thing for it, but the idea of looking inside to kind of find answers to outside. Um, and I think if everyone was doing that on a daily basis, we'd all be much better off. But. Um, <laughs> And, and they all link to imagination as well. But anyway. All right. So I think we have uh, under a minute, but I just wanted to get to Adam real quick. Just oh. a few words. And then also Carola. Okay. Be free. <laughs> Be free. Okay. Yeah, I think Be that's free. Key. I think, yeah, just to, to allow people to express themselves however they want to. And I think that is something that should be taught at a really young age. Um, and I think if they're going to fund the arts, I think funding – paint and and providing supplies for kids when they're growing up is a great way to like start the, to ignite the fire of creativity and imagination so thank you adam uh corolla yeah well i think i i um i think it's important that people stay and young young children stay curious and that we keep on curious for growing and not that well, we live in a very distracted world a lot of distraction, a lot of external stimuli, that we stay connected with who we are and that we follow our own path, which is good for us. So staying connected and curious and self-belief. Basically, in a nutshell. Uh, okay. And then um, I, think, I think I would leave is uh, believe in yourself and believe in the community around you and uh, never give up. I think those are kind of good things to think through. Um, since we're recording, uh, just um, I think we're just going to wrap up nice and kindly and for ourselves. So I think let's go around the horn one more time. Uh, how, uh, I think I would say, uh, Jonathan, how do we find you? How do we, if someone wants to talk with you and really get more into art, how can, yeah. how can people seek you out? I'm on Instagram, Jonathan Allen Studio, all one word. Um, and my website is jonathanallen.org. Wonderful, wonderful. Emma, how can people find you if you want to be found? Like, I know. <laughs> you seem popular. <laughs> well, no, again, that's the tension. Some of us, you know, some days not. But no, definitely. My studio is in London. So if anyone's in London, but also yeah, get in touch on Instagram, Emma Cousin. Um, and my my website is emmacousin.org. Uh, info, which is very annoying. Someone had dot com, so it's uh, <laughs> okay. Okay, Adam. Adam, uh, you people find me, you? Uh, someone originally had Adam Cooley, but I, I got it eventually. Um, okay. but you, can, <laughs> you can get you can find me on Instagram. It's I am Adam Cooley. Duck, or, uh, I am Adam Cooley, and my website is I am Adam Cooley dot com. If you look up Adam Cooley dot com, it'll also lead you there. Um, and if you can write in Japanese, you can find and there's a bunch of of websites that are available yeah. around as well. But, and yeah. then, uh, Carola, yes, tell, tell us find... how we can find you. 
I have a website, coronabufflick.com. You can find me on Instagram under coronabufflick and Facebook. Yeah. I'm everywhere. Oh, yeah. good, good. I like that. We, we have a really nice, exciting, you know, um, energetic panel. Uh, you can find me at the Allosphere Research Group at UCSB, Digi- Digital Futures World, uh, the Guild of Future Architects, and then my own website. Um, other than that, I wanted to say thank you, thank you, thank you, everyone. I know it was uh, started a little hectic, but I believe about imagination and the power of art. And um, I've been in this life now for a long, long time. I don't want to reveal my age, but what I do know is that um, I feel young at heart every day. That's, that's my purpose in life. So I wanted to thank you, everyone, and let's keep in touch. All right. Take care. Thank you. Thanks for managing it. Yes. Yeah.